Virginia is where Anne grew up. That was her homestead. Um, so we don't really know much about how or when or where Isaac and Anne met. It's very likely that they met through mutual social circles. Um, and they were ultimately married on December 1st, 1803. Anne was 21 and Isaac was 45. After her marriage, Anne wasn't just a new bride. She became immediately a stepmother to Isaac and Nellie's two children. So by that time, little Nellie was 14 years old and little Madison was 10. And then between 1805 and 1819, Anne and Isaac had 10 more kids and you can see them listed here. All of them survived to adulthood. Some of them barely made it to adulthood, but they survived their childhood, which was quite a feat of the time. And it was something that Anne didn't take lightly. She knew how blessed she and Isaac were to have their children survive. Some of them were sickly. Sickness was part of life, but they survived, which she was, she talked about frequently how grateful she was. <laughs> to understand Anne is to understand her unflinching love of her family. Nearly all of her letters that we have talk about her deep devotion to her family and not just her immediate family, not just her kids, but her extended family. So aunts, cousins, sons-in-law, daughters-in-laws, family was everything to her. And um, on June 20th, 1825, when she was 43, she says, nothing can equal the happiness of a parent blessed with the society of virtuous children, all living in love and harmony. She seemed to really love having a house full of kids, sort of the, the chaos, the energetic chaos of having a house full of kids was something she seemed to really, she talked about frequently and she seemed to really love. <clears throat> One of the great things about this collection of letters that we have is that it does span over 20 years. And so we get to kind of watch Anne grow up a bit um, and, and mature. So you pick up on her mannerisms and um, you do get to know her in so many ways, but, um, you kind of sense a bit of melancholy as she gets older of watching her kids grow up. Um, not that she's not happy, of course, right? But to watch her kids get up, grow up, get married, find their own happiness. But there's a bit of melancholy because she does miss having that house full of kids. Um, she, she was also very likely never alone. I think her kids would always come and visit. And so she, I don't think she was ever just her and Isaac sitting at a dinner table in silence. I think there was always an, a youthful energy of some capacity, even down to grandkids. But she was very close to her eldest daughter, Anne Maury Height. And after Anne married, um, she wrote her daughter um, on March 14th, 1826, when at this point Anne was 44 years old. She said, I will not tell you exactly how much you are missed at Belle Grove. Your seat at our noisy board has never been unobserved by me. Now it has a new proprietor, but I feel well assured that my dear child is happy and that is sufficient. Your father and all the children send you both more love than this letter will hold. Remember me kindly to all of your friends. Heaven bless you both is the daily prayer of your affectionate mother. I'm going to read a few quotes from Anne on, on, in, on this particular topic because I think it's really important that you hear Anne in her own words talk about her family. Um, I can't give it justice the way she can. So one more quote and then I'll, I'll stop. Um, on July 5th, 1827, she wrote one of her best friends, Elizabeth Steenberg, and who she wrote a lot. She wrote quite frequently. And she said to her, I perfectly accord with you, my good friend, that there is more pleasure in raising a family of children than in parting with them, however advantageously their lots may be cast. You could probably call this empty nest syndrome. I think a bit of the bittersweetness of watching your kids grow up. Um, and I talk about this because I think it's one of the more relatable moments in Anne's life. And there's not much she's, you know, she lived over 200 years ago. There's not a lot we can connect with her on, but I think this one sentiment is something that we can connect with her on. Um, we've all watched, it doesn't even have to be your own kids. It could be a neighbor that you watched grow up. We can all kind of relate to her on that, on that level. <clears throat> So to understand Anne, part of it was her devotion to her family. The other pillar of her life was her devotion to her religion. Um, as she was a very devout woman from her childhood to her death, she was part of the Episcopal Church Revival in Virginia during the 1820s and 30s and actually helped build the church you see on the screen. This is St. Thomas Episcopal Church, which was built in 1837, and it still stands to this day in Middletown, Virginia. Anne's faith is another thing that you, it's in every one of her letters that you read. Um, she gets a little preachier as she gets older. Her, she kind of does more block quotes of, of scripture. Um, but 
I encourage you to read through some of her letters and I pulled out some quotes. Um, her devotion is palpable in her letters and you can tell that her religion, she relied on it in everything in life from being a mother to dealing with suffering, dealing with grief, dealing with sickness, dealing with happiness, everything she, she hung her hat on her religion, good, bad, and otherwise. Um, so I do encourage you to, to explore that. We're still trying to get to know and understand the enslaved labor at Bell Grove, which is another ongoing research initiative. But Anne's letters do help us piece together some of this narrative. Um, we're able to meet the enslaved workers by name. We have a, we're getting to know what a family unit may have looked like on Bell Grove for the enslaved labor, learning about their, the, their tasks, their responsibilities, the expectations. It's a little, it's uncomfortable to read in her letters, um, but it is a really valuable um, teaching resource. So we've, we've tried to leverage it accordingly. In 1820, we know that there were 103 enslaved people at Bell Grove who performed a range of tasks from tending the fields to cooking, blacksmithing, woodworking. Um, the cook was considered one of the most valuable enslaved people on the property with the highest level of training. And often the enslaved children would help as well in the kitchen, getting water, bringing in firewood and things of that sort. The drawing you see here is actually an artist's interpretation of Judah or Judy, as she was often called. Um, she's one of the enslaved women who Isaac bought from his cousin, Abraham Bowman. We know that Judah came to Bell Grove in 1816 um, with her two young boys, George and Sam. And then Judah proceeded to have 10 more kids over the next 20 years. She had four little girls and six little boys. Judah died in 1836 from a lung ailment when her youngest son, Jonathan, was only five weeks old. I try not to make a habit of reading directly off of a PowerPoint slide, but I think that this quote is powerful and needs to be read aloud. So Anne talks about Judah's death in a letter she wrote on April 5th, 1836. She said, during the last two weeks, my cook was dangerously ill with a complaint, one of great suffering, a violent pleurisy in the first instance, terminating in an inflammation of the heart, which was most distressing. She finally went under the disease on Saturday morning, leaving 12 children, the youngest only five weeks old. I deplore her loss to her younger children more than my own inconvenience, which is very considerable. But it is the will of him that cannot err, of course. It is wisest best. I shall endeavor to discharge the additional duties that devolve upon me to the best of my ability. It's a heavy quote. It's a difficult one to unpack from a 21st century vantage point. So in the exhibit, I ask you, the audience, and I'm asking you now to think about what you think about Anne's reaction to Judah's death. And I'd love to hear your thoughts um, at the end. What's interesting is that Anne grew up in a somewhat progressive environment. Her maternal grandmother, Mar I say somewhat progressive, <laughs> um, her, her maternal grandmother, Mary Stith Dawson Grimes, freed one of her enslaved woman, women, a woman by the name of Maria. After she died, it was sort of a no strings attached except there kind of were. Her, her Maria's children were still enslaved, but in, in Mary's will, she requested that Maria's children also be freed or manumitted when they were 21 years old and that whomever their enslaver was would have to educate them, teach them how to read. That was ultimately outlawed in Virginia, but it was still legal at the time. We don't know if, if Anne's upbringing at all affected her perspective on enslavement, but we do know she was an enslaver until the day she died. Uh, one day before her death on January 5th, 1861, she wrote in her last will and testament, I request that my Negro man John may have the privilege of choosing a master. It's possible that John was one of the few enslaved people left under Anne's supervision, Isaac had requested that each of his sons receive two enslaved males and two enslaved females. And then it was up to Anne's discretion to give whomever, in, whomever she deemed proper in terms of the enslaved to her daughters. Um, we don't, when Anne, we know that when Anne died, John wasn't listed in her inventory of possessions. She only, she had Jim, who was an enslaved blacksmith valued at $450. Elijah, an enslaved man valued at $800, Sally, an enslaved cook valued at $175, and Martha, Sally's enslaved child valued at $250.
Anne's life does have a lot of teachable moments. Um, so we've created a few activities to try to engage and maybe hopefully inspire students. It's a little quirky, so bear with me. <laughs> this slide's a little quirky. Um, we, I, we have an activity to colorize the black and white photo we have of Anne. Um, it's, I found a website, there's a lot of ways to do this, but I'm trying, I tried to create the activities where teachers can kind of use it out of the box and there's no bells and whistles. So don't need to add to teachers plates, we're trying to help. So Algorithmia, um, you just go and plug in the URL, which I provide, and it allows students to plug in her picture. And then the purple line you see is a slider. So you can compare the black and white photo with the colorized version and the colorized is more of like a sepia but it's still it picks up different details and it's a easy creative way for students to engage with this primary source and then it gets even quirkier i have something called glitching which is where you randomly go in and change the code of an image again there's a lot of ways to do this um, I did some, I, I, I'm not a computer scientist and I wrote steps on how to do it. And I think for teenagers, especially this will be second nature, but it's a way to randomly change the code. And what you see on the right, the image on the right is an open notepad, which has the code for the image and then the original black and white photo. And if you have them both open at the same time, as you update the code and save, it'll automatically update the picture in real time. So you're able to distort it. And by doing this distortion, you're able, it's again, a creative way to try to engage with the primary source, but you're trying to look, have a new lens to look at something old. Um, I don't think it's going to be earth shattering or anything mind blowing, but it's just, it's a way for students to kind of, to engage with that primary source beyond just saying she was an old woman with a Bible by her side. There's, it's a little bit, hopefully it encourages them to dig a little bit deeper. Um, and then we have two, we have actually three more activities that we that we um, included. Um, theorem paintings, which is what you see on the left. They were a real popular art medium between 1830 and 1850 um, that utilized stencils to paint on linen and velvet. And did a, a good number of theorem paintings. And the one on the left is one that's still hanging in the manor home. We've removed the color so it's a good old-fashioned coloring sheet which anybody can use because it's a stress reliever for anybody um, but we have an act that's more of an activity for elementary kids up to to adults and then we were fortunate enough to have Shenandoah University the Shenandoah Center for Immersive Learning create this video that is a walking tour of the manor home and in the tour, they have Anne giving a first person tour. So it's a first person interpretation of the manor home. And so it takes you through room by room as though you're walking with Anne. It's a, it's a great resource. And what we've, what, in terms of the activity, we've, we've saw it as an opportunity to engage students in historical thinking. Um, you obviously hear Anne's perspective, but it's a, it's a way of poking holes and saying, who don't you hear? What are some, what's the perspective? What are some biases that you sense? It's any way of really looking at history. They're questions you should be asking regardless. So um, another way to try to engage students. And then kind of a classic open-ended question of what do you think of Mrs. Height? After you go through the exhibit and you look at the sources, it's a way to say everybody's going to have their opinions, and I hope that they do. So it's a way, it's an open ended way of, of sharing what you think. And with that, I, I will ask what you guys think. Um, Jess, I'm going to just jump in here. Um, I, I want to let everyone know that you're welcome to put questions in the chat. We have only about 30 people joining us today, about 34. So I don't think that's too chaotic if we if we want to try to take turns and unmute to ask questions or have conversation. Um, you know, Zoom being what it is, we have to be careful not to talk over each other. But um, but we can give that a try. We are recording this, um, and I so wanted to let you know that as well because there's some people that weren't able to join us today, the um, recording will just be shared with people who registered for this, for this talk today. Um, I don't think we'll be posting it online, just sharing it privately. Um, but I started the recording a little bit late, so and some of you joined a little bit late. So if you don't mind, I'll just recap um, that Jess Pritter, Pritchard River, who you've just been hearing from, is a wonderful asset to Belgrove as a volunteer. She's a master's degree student and um, 
the digital humanities at George Mason University and jump in if I got that wrong. No, get that? Yeah, you're good. Uh, mm -hmm. And and her interest in our history and in, in new ways to interpret the history um, aligned perfectly with our situation as a historic site that um, had to be closed during COVID, needs new ways to reach out to students because we can't have field trips and many other reasons. So um, this, has been a, this has been a really great project for us to work on to think how we present some of our information. Um, so Jess, I was gonna just start off with a couple questions for you. Um, sure. mm -hmm. So you had said at the top that, you know, you had primary source material, you had Anne's letters, but that um, you had decided there, there has to be a better way. And I know you spent hours on this exhibit. Um, it's easier said than done, but you felt like there were better, more creative ways to um, showcase those primary sources. And so you did it through different layouts, um, different graphics. Um, do you want to just sort of give a few examples of that or your thinking behind that? Sure. With, with Anne's letters, I tried to pull out the, theme, the themes of her, of life in the valley. And then from there, I knew it was important that we had a, a section on the enslaved labor with the data we learned from Anne's sources. So I pulled that out to have its own page um, and then try to, again, kind of pull out the different themes. Otherwise it can be a bit of a fire hose of information for it. It was for me too, when I'm trying to sort through it. Um, so I tried to think about all of Anne and, um, and try to figure out how to best give folks kind of the reader's digest of her life. And, um, and so that was how I ended up coming up with kind of the, the layout of meet Anne, meet the enslaved labor, really delve into her letters, and then some of the educational resources, which is always fun to create. Does that answer your question, Kristen? Yeah, I was just, you know, I just, I want to commend you because I, again, I know it wasn't quick work. Um, mm -hmm. Just the sort of graphic decisions that you made and the oh, way sure. that, um, people are, and we will look, we'll look at the site maybe in a minute. Um, sure. You sort of lead people through. I think is very is very useful. Um, you're digesting a lot of history without kind of maybe feeling like you are. You're not reading long pieces of text, in my opinion. Right. Um, right. Sure. So that's. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was trying. I know. I I I love history. There's really nothing that I that I read that I don't love. But of course, even I get kind of bored. You lose interest online. Um, and so I did try to keep it snappy so that even if folks only give us five minutes they can still go in and at least walk away hopefully with some knowing a little bit more than they did five minutes before um, and then with 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 the digital exhibit it's all about layers so it's all about if you want to learn more we provide enough so it's either hyperlinking out or, or sort of embedding different things so it's all about different entry points into the exhibit so that you kind of hit a wide audience um, so the, there's data there if you wanted if you wanted if you have more than five minutes and you want to dig you certainly can but if you're just kind of curious you'll at least be able to walk away and say she loved her family she loved religion and um, she was an enslaver and that's really heavy you know like if those are the three things you take away I'm okay with that <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we did have a good question a couple of good questions come in the chat um, one was did do her letters, and I sort of know how I'd answer this question, but you, you've been really close to the material. Um, do any of her letters discuss um, her relationship with Isaac? Yeah, so Isaac was sick almost their whole marriage. And so she does talk about Isaac in almost every letter, and it's mainly taking care of him. That's the main, that's been my take, main takeaway is she, she took care of him really their whole marriage until his death. He was always sick and kind of, yeah, he just seemed to complain a lot about just simply not feeling good. So a lot of her days were spent trying to make him feel better. Yeah, and I would just say our, the letters we have over there, we're so grateful that we have them. They are not comprehensive. So they, they, are, they came to us through different family members, um, descendants. And so there, there's snapshots in time of her marriage. Um, and she was quite a bit younger than he was. Um, and so we don't, we don't really have any 
writings of hers from their early days of marriage and when uh, they were having you know, children every other year. I mean, perhaps she had no time to write letters, um, but we, we really don't have a super comprehensive and we don't have a diary, you know, that would be so amazing. Um, and so that's one of the, the great things that Jess has done is with disparate pieces of information, trying to tie together a narrative, a story um, that we can tell about Anne. We had another question about was Anne the mistress, you know, what happened to Belgrove after she died and um, what happened to Belgrove during the Civil War. So, um, so yes, yeah, so Anne dies in 1851. Um, we have a lot of theories about what it may have gone on, gone on in the house, um, at, at, to, the, to the property after that date. The son of, that was slated to inherit Belgrove had, had sadly predeceased Anne. He had died in an accident. So um, that could have made the estate more complicated uh, since he was not living as well. And, and ultimately we know that in 1860, they sell Belgrove to two, two brothers who live locally, um, John and Benjamin Cooley. Um, and Jess actually has another online exhibit that, that has to, pertains to them a little bit um, that we might be rolling out in a couple months. Um, so, so yes, so Anne was no longer the, um, was no longer the, um, the mistress at the time of the Civil War. Uh, let's see, I think we have some other questions. Um, what was Anne's education and what was her experience, um, life experience like? Did she travel? Um, how would we compare that to maybe other women of her era or in this region? We know that I know education was a, a very big part of her upbringing. Her mother, after her her dad died um, when Anne was young, and her mother started a school. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Kristen, because there's a lot of information. I don't want to make sure I'm not giving bum scoop. Um, I know that as education was important for Anne growing up, but then it was really important on her when she had her kids, and that's something I didn't talk about, but I tried it tried to include in the exhibit finding the right tutor and educating her children, boys and girls alike, was a, another really big part of being a mother for her and something that she focused a lot on. So I don't know in terms of um, what it compared to with other, other women of the time. Um, and I don't know that she was really very well traveled. I, I know she lived, I think she floated about the state of Virginia, but I don't think she was a world traveler or anything like that. Uh, yeah, I would agree. Um, yeah, she, she wasn't like she had gone on a grand tour of Europe or, or something like that. Um, and I do believe that the education she received was like the school her mother operated. So done with, with groups of people um, in their local community. Uh, she didn't, she wasn't, she didn't go away to school. Um, and likewise, her daughters received that same type of education cl close to home. Um, and not, not going away to school. That said, in Isaac Heights' will, he does note that the children he and Anne had together would come into their inheritance if they had done at least two years of schooling at the University of Virginia. And we know some of their, their sons went to the University of Virginia. So, um, so we know that was definitely an, an important um, value that that Isaac Hyde had, and that Nellie Madison Hyde had as well. They sent their children for schooling in Winchester to a, the home of a friend of theirs who, who provided that type of education. So we had a question about, could we see some of the video tour? Um, and we could try that. I don't know how streaming through Zoom may get choppy. Do you want um, me to? Do you want me to go to the site and- Yeah, do you mind going to the site and we'll see? Turn it on. Turn it on. If we can, I'm just checking the chat to make sure we've gotten out all the questions. You all see educational resources? I do. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, I do, one note I'll make is that um, 
one thing that I like about the site and we'd love your feedback to see if, if you think it's true. When we give tours of Belgrade, we do show the image of Anne and that's a photograph that was taken very late in her life. Um, and it evokes, and this is why I think it's kind of interesting that Jess has done some edu educational activities that involve manipulating that photograph because you, you get an instant perception, a personality, you start putting maybe um, our modern viewpoint on, on how she looks. Um, and, and so that you, because it, we're very fortunate to have that image, but the same token, I think sometimes we let that override other evidence. And so one of the nice things I think about this exhibit was showing her voice through her letters, um, giving more context to her life, um, so that you can see a, you know, no pun intended, a, a fuller picture of the person, a full, her full humanity as an individual, and the, com the conflicts inherent in her life and living in that time. Yeah, I agree. Um, I don't know if you want to, and also my computer is a dinosaur, so I don't know if it's going to work, but we can turn. Yeah, let's, <laughs> give, it, let's give it a try. And okay. Welcome and, to Bell Grove Plantation. This manor house is where Isaac Height Jr. and his family lived starting in 1797. Also living on the plantation were 276 enslaved men, women, and children who he owned. This tour is given from the perspective of Isaac Height's wife, Anne. Particular focus has been placed on the experience of African Americans at Bell Grove, providing a glimpse of what their lives were like here. In Anne's letters, she refers to the enslaved workers as servants or hands, not slaves. What does this tell you about how slavery was thought about during this time period? So that, that streamed very well for me. And then I think what you do is it allows you to walk into the room. Do you want me to keep going? I'm sorry. Um, what, do you mind just showing for a minute the, um, how one manipulates from room to room. Sure. In the corner. And I came here to live here at Bell Grove when I married Major Isaac Kite Jr. in 1802. We lived here together until he passed in 1836. I've carried on managing the plantation since then with the help of our good sons. I love the view out the front door on the entryway of the house. It is a beautiful view of the mountains. Sometimes, looking out past the Blue Ridge Mountains in the distance, I miss my home in Orange, Virginia. The Bell Grove became my home, and it will be for the rest of my life. I wonder what the servants and the hands see when they look through these doors. Did they see a different world? Did they see a different world than me? I have a lot to say, but I think I'll leave it. <laughs> <laughs> so so this, this is the gist of it. You can kind of engage with the video right so you can move from room to room and then within the room you can you can look around so three they did 360 filming so you can see all up and down left and right and out the window um, so if you've never been to Bell Grove it will give you a chance to see the entire entire manor house including um, a room on the lower level which is the kitchen um, the the script was written by uh, university students, Shenandoah University students. They, in particular, wanted to, to have it said by through Anne's voice um, and wanted to include a lot of discussion of the history of enslavement at Bell Grove. Um, but as was just said, and sort of my reaction to, um, I'm glad that this is, this is part of her exhibit and that, and that by the time you come to this video, you have maybe learned more about about Anne or thinking you'll maybe a little more critically um, so that you'll you'll take this as, as a piece of information, but maybe not not the whole thing. <laughs> does that does that sort of capture? Yeah, I think it's characters? I think it's a good opportunity for historical thinking where I think it's really cool to have a first person tour of the home. But as with anything, you kind of have to come to any sort of source analytically to kind of get the whole picture. I think that's, again, how to handle history responsibly. 
So that was part of the activity was trying to engage in historical thinking for students. Yeah, and it's just really challenging. And this is the reason why Belgrave doesn't do first person interpretation. It, it is really challenging for us in our current, current time and current mindsets to really accurately um, talk about you know, what Anne might have said or how she might have spoken about her home or even her, her behavior or what her voice was like. Um, so, so that is, um, it was very brave and uh, adventurous for, for the students to try. Um, but, but, you know, when I, when I go see good first person interpretation at Williamsburg or other places, other sites, I'm highly appreciative. Um, it is very, very hard. It's, it's I think that one of the hardest things you can do as a historian. I agree. So, um, I don't know if there's if uh, folks have any more questions or if you want me to kind of click briefly through each. Um, I don't know what you all want to do. I'll take my cues from you. <laughs> yeah, why don't you go back and show just a couple more, a couple more things? Sure. So when you come to this is the main landing page. Um, this is the main landing page of, of Anne's exhibit. And again, we have meet Anne, meet the enslaved people of the property, her letters, and then the educational resources. And this. And then so Anne's, when you actually meet Anne, I've again. Um, there are a lot more quotes and a little, obviously, a good bit more context. Um, I tried to, I said I tried to pull the data out and try to try to organize things thematically, but then I also try really hard to maintain neutrality with exhibits. I think that's part of handling history responsibly. So throughout the throughout the exhibit, I've tried to ask questions of did you know? So a little trivia, or also what do you think? Um, I'm tr I hope they're not rhetorical questions, and if they seem very partial, I would I'd like to fix that because I think it's more important to present the data, kind of scaffold it in a way that you can digest it, and then ask questions to try to, to stimulate um, discussion. So on Anne's page, I've again kind of done little snippets of what kind of made her, I think, the woman that she was. So her marriage, her being a, the plantation mistress, being a mother her religion, and then her widowhood, and what life looked like for her after Isaac died. And then the enslaved people, this, um, I, I really do hope that you all will, will delve into this a little bit. Some of the, I read the quote about Judah, but there are, there are other letters she wrote that I think are, they're heavy, but I think it's important that we read them. Um, so here we, and again, we don't know that much. We're still it truly is a narrative we're still working on. Um, but I, um, yeah, I tried to organize it the best I could and as carefully as I could. Um, and her, and here with the, when I was talking about kind of layering the site, this is what I'm talking about. So I tried to, this has, this is probably the text heaviest part of the exhibit. And it's just because there is, um, I tried to add texture around the quotes so that they weren't misinterpreted. Um, but then we also have links to some of the primary sources. So if you want to delve into the, the estate inventory, you certainly can, but I didn't. It's information overload if you put everything on the site and then I lose everybody's attention and it's counterproductive. Um, and then her letters is probably one of the richer parts of the site, obviously, because it's what drove the exhibit. Um, and on, I've broken, again, broken it down thematically, but then there are subcategories. So you, you can read quotes from her on education, on educating her kids and on death, which was everywhere in her life at the time and how she relied on faith to work through death. Um, so there's a lot more than what I, what I talked about. So again, I would love to know what folks think if you get a chance to go through it. And then the educational resources. And I know that the glitching and the colorizing, again, it's uh, it's quirky. Uh, so I tried, I was a technical writer in a former life. So I've tried to detail kind of step-by-step step, and I, I truly have faith that anybody can do it. If I could do it, truly you can do it. Um, 
and anybody can do it um, without any bells and whistles. So I hope, I hope you'll play around with it. And if it's a total flop, tell me, that's okay too. <laughs> yeah, we're very interested. If you all have connections, we are very interested in um, reaching out to schools and inviting them to use this resource. Um, I'm offering, um, this is good until uh, June, uh, we have funding, Bell Grove is part of Cedar Creek and Bell Grove National Historical Park. And um, through some special funding, we can offer free of charge a virtual tour. So it's ideal for say a classroom of no more than 30 students, um, but I can give a guided tour of a few of the rooms and introduce some of this material uh, to students. Um, it's geared for fourth and fifth graders, but it can be scaled up easily for high school. Um, and then they could possibly use this website, this, this online exhibit as an additional um, learning opportunity. So after their tour, when they've sort of gotten an introduction to the site, then delve in deeper um, and use some of the educational activities. Now, I know the teachers right now are completely overloaded. Um, it's been an incredibly long year. Um, many of them are moving back into the classroom and perhaps their students, the last thing they wanna do is look at a screen. Um, but again, they're unable to visit right now our site. Um, they're not organizing field trips and putting kids on buses any more than they need to be. So um, it is a resource um, that we're happy to offer. So if you, if you know schools, I'll put in the chat uh, our contact information and I'd be happy to talk to any school. That's the beauty of it. It can be across the country. They don't, doesn't have to be local at all. Um, so happy to, happy to do that. Any last questions? You're welcome to unmute yourself if you prefer rather than put something in the chat. Jess, do you have, um, I think you, you had said, you know, sort of a, one of the nice things about the site is you are a very good writer and you write in a very engaging way. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that that sort of draws you in once maybe a person to read more. <laughs> you sort of <laughs> must acknowledge yeah. that like, yeah, history can be kind of dense. Um, but I know you had to work through different, you know, sort of emotions, even just dealing with the content. Um, yeah. Are you willing to talk more about that? Sure. It was part of the sluggishness of getting into the exhibit initially. Um, and, um, and to me, it, her story felt kind of cliche and I, I didn't know where I was going to go with it to make people care truthfully. Um, she just seemed like another privileged white woman. And I thought, I don't know how I'm going to, I don't know how, I don't think people are going to care about this. Um, but her letters, her letters are, it's all, I, I love history for the people. Some folks like the battles. I like the people. And with Anne, she's, there are parts of her life that are still relatable and you can connect with it. So that was part of what helped me get over my, over the, the block in the beginning was reading her letters and realizing that she really was a person. She wasn't just that black and white image that we see at the at them in the manor home. Um, and her life was complicated and it was a complicated time with a lot of layers that were emotional. And there were times that my husband would be like, you seem preoccupied. And I'm like, I don't know what I'm gonna do with this. I don't know how I'm gonna go with this and make and balance all of the complexities of her life um, and try to, to handle her story responsibly. There have, I had sort of learned Anne in two schools of thought. She was, one was sort of a very whitewashy um, gone with the wind narrative and then another one was she was an enslaver and there's no other noun to describe her and so both extremes kind of do a disservice to her story which has so much that we can learn from and um, and so trying to reconcile that uh, was challenging and I, I, I hope um, if you come to the exhibit and you see biases or areas that aren't that you don't particularly like we really do welcome your feedback because we want to make sure that we're where we are handling everything responsibly. Um, that's really the goal is to teach and be responsible with the story and not feed into one extreme over the other. Um, 
you know, our goal is to teach above and above everything else. It's to teach. And I hope, I hope that's the takeaway when you leave the exhibit. Yeah. I, it, yeah. I think you, it was, when you had sort of your epiphany to, um, to sort of break her life into different themes and to, to really highlight her humanity, I think that sort of, it all started to come together. Yeah. Um, that's a big part of our, our research and interpretation on the enslaved individuals at Belle Grove is to, is to highlight their humanity. Um, and, so, and so all parties involved, um, including being on the enslaver side, um, that was, that's part of the story too. So, um, I've, and I've thought a good bit about, about why there was such writer's block and history is really uncomfortable really uncomfortable. I feel like you should be uncomfortable when you're learning about it. I feel like that means you're doing it right. And this story was certainly no different. There were a lot of moments that I had to step away for a few days and just kind of digest it. I never wasn't thinking about it. And some, I feel like some folks are better at compartmentalizing. I'm not, I'm super weepy, super weepy when I learn about history and I kind of take it with me in maybe an unhealthy way, but I, it consumes me. So um, yeah, it's, it's uncomfortable. And you, you should be a little squeamish when you learn about it. And yeah, yeah. at least my take, some folks may not agree with me, but I think it, it's uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. I, but it well, doesn't I, mean we shouldn't talk about it. Sorry. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I, I appreciate um, that sort of energy, that care that you brought to the topic, um, because I, I think it shows, I mean, um, and, and thank, you. thank you for taking on that burden. I mean, thank that you. that is that is a big part of, working in this history is it's hard history and um, you do have to, to take pause um, and to thank people for, for taking on that hardness with you. Yeah, thank you. Um, we had a, a couple last questions in the chat um, about, you know, can we do any of her family members, are they helpful in, in, in learning more about her life? And so from, from what I am aware of that, we're fortunate that some of her family members made made her paper, some of her papers available and, and left them to Belle Grove. Belle Grove is there. There are many historic homes in our region that have a connection to the Height family. We're the only one that um, is operating as a museum, so we become a natural repository when Height family members decide they that they would like to to put their family paper somewhere. So we were fortunate, I think, to have the letters that we do, but, but we don't have many living ancestors today, even though the Hyde Family Association is very active and um, come for reunions. Um, we don't have many people living today that have any kind of oral history or direct information that we're aware of about, about her. Um, and then another good question that came is, um, and maybe Jess, you have an opinion, that after Isaac's death, so he died in 1836, and she lived a good 15 more years. Um, was she the de facto CEO of Belgro? Um, did you come away with a sense of her level of responsibility and how much she was maybe sharing that with her sons? Or I, I get the impression she was. She was strong, but I don't know that I would call her the CEO. I think she deferred mm -hmm. to the men in her life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's my take. Uh, yeah, that would be my take as well. Um, but they did, I did have um, a kind of an epiphany. I did uh, feel like, like she may have completely demurred to the men in her life. And then we... Um, had a, a situation where uh, we were able to see a document where one of the enslaved um, members of, you know, of Belle Grove was freed, it was sold to his father who eventually freed him. So it was a legal document of sale, bill of sale. And Anne is listed among two other executors of Isaac's will, his estate. Um, and so to see her in a legal document in that era in 1836, to elevated her in my mind as, you know, that the men in her family saw her as an, perhaps an equal participant in, in how the Belgro was run or how Isaac Heights estate was settled. Um, so that sort of opened a door, a crack uh, to, for me to, to think 
well, perhaps if she had more influence. She was given a life estate. So living uh, at Belle Grove until her death was, was already arranged for. Um, and as you think, she relied on male members of the family, sons-in-law and sons to, to help her navigate the world in which they were living, which women didn't have um, the rights they have today. So, um, but, so I do think she had probably a lot of control of how the household was run. Um, but as she aged, you know, maybe not the ability to do as much as she had in her younger years. Okay, well, we're just about at one o'clock. So um, if you have any further questions, I'll put our, my email address in the chat in a second. And, um, but I wanna thank Jess so much for all, all you've done for us on this project, um, all the care you've taken with the subject matter and, and the beautiful way you've displayed it. Thank you. I'm happy to see so many folks on. It was nice to talk with you guys. Yeah, and so the website again is just virtual.bellgrove.org. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, great. Right. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Take Have care. Have a wonderful afternoon, everyone. Thanks. You too. Bye. Bye.